Good morning, Miss Walsh here. Today is morning and we are going to discuss industrial relations and that is Unit 1. Thank you. So for this morning's lesson, we're going to look at the following learning intentions. Describe a possible industrial conflict and show how the law would be used to solve it. The second one, outline non-legislative ways of solving conflict within the workplace. Explain what, a trade, what trade unions are and outline their role in industrial conflict. Evaluate, negotiate, conciliation and arbitration. They are all used to resolve industrial conflict in the workplace. We are also going to look at illustrating the impact of trade unions on different stakeholders. Illustrate how legislation affects different business relationships. Illustrate both fair and unfair grounds for dismissal from employment. Also we're going to look at outline the impact of legislation on employment equality and finally we're going to evaluate the role of the WRC and the Labour Court in, in, in improving workplace relations and resolving industrial disputes. Okay we're going to begin by um, defining what industrial relations is. Industrial relations refer to the relationship between employers and employees within the workplace. There's four main causes. Well, the four main causes we're going to look at today are low wages, poor working conditions, redundancy and promotions. Okay, there's two methods of solving industrial relations. The first one will be non-legislative method of, in of solving industrial relation conflict. Okay, so what does that mean? That means the employer and the employee will try to resolve the conflict themselves or with the help of others but without reference of the laws of Ireland or to any legal agency. So we're going to resolve, we may resolve conflict through number one negotiation, number two trade union, number three ICTU, number four conciliation and five arbitration. Those five methods are non-legislative methods of resolving conflict within the workplace. Okay, I'm going to talk you through each one individually now. So let's look at number one, which is in negotiation. Both employee and employer try to reach a mutual acceptable solution to the conflict. Trade union is an industrial, uh, sorry, trade union is an interest group that represents employees' views and interests. Employees pay an annual subscription to join the trade union and two typical examples there will be ICTU and SIP2. Also, so let's just look now at the functions of each trade union. Number one, they try to get better pay and working conditions for their members. If an employee has a dispute with their employer, protects its members' interests. Trade unions Represent, uh, trade unions will elect a shop steward to represent them. A shop steward is a spokesperson elected by employees as their official union representative in the workplace. And his or her main functions are to, number one, recruit new members for the union. Number two, represent members in negotiation with management. Number three, keep members up to date with information with union head office. And number four, inform union head office of members' concerns. Okay, so the third me non-legislative method of solving conflict within the workplace, um, ICTU, which is Irish Congress of Trade Union. Just take note of the ICTU, it regularly comes up as a short question in, in the in section A of the paper. So ICTU is an interest group which represents almost all trade unions within Ireland. And its main function, it gives permission to, for all out strikes. It settles disputes between unions. It provides training for unions. And it also promotes the cause of trade union membership or movement. The fourth method of solving conflict in the workplace is conciliation. And again, this is an important term to remember. It means that the two parties in a dispute ask a neutral, independent outsider called an arbitrator conciliator to help them solve their problem. 
The conciliator encourages both sides to meet and talk out their problems. She acts as a, a facilitator and offers them advice and guidance in the search for a, solu a possible solution to their conflict. And the fifth one is also an important um, note one to remember. An arbitration is when the employer and the employee ask a neutral and independent person called an arbitrator to invest the, investigate the dispute and make a ruling, like a judge, to solve the problem. The arbitrator listens to both sides of the argument, investigates the dispute and gives his or her judgments as to how the dispute should best be resolved. Okay, now we're going to look at the legislative methods of solving industrial relations conflicts within the workplace. And there's four, five main, main ones. The first one we'll look at is Industrial Relations Act 1990. The second one is the Workplace Relations Commission or the WRC. The third one is the Labour Court. Fourth is the Unfair Dismissals Act 1977 to 2007. Number five is the Employment Equality Act 1998 to 2015. So let's just first of all look at the Industrial Relations Act 1990. Okay, so starting off, trade dispute. What is a trade dispute? It is a dispute between an employer and an employee in connection with the employment or non-employment of employees and the terms and conditions of the job. A secret ballot must be held in order for a strike to take place. That is where all member, union members are given the right to vote. The majority will, deci will decide. And if the majority decides to go on strike or take industrial action, then a, a week's notice must be given to the employer. And this, in turn, will give the, employee, the employer the opportunity to further negotiate with employees to resolve the issue. Okay, we're under the Industrial Relations Act 1990, we have two types of picketing. So if an industrial action or strike takes place, there's two forms of picketing. The first one is primary picketing, and this is where um, the employees protest outside their employer's business premises by walking around outside the grounds carrying placards. The second type of picketing is secondary picketing. Employees protect protest outside another employer's business premises. They can only do this if the other employer is helping their boss to break their strike. Otherwise, secondary picketing is illegal. Immunity then, employees cannot be sued by their employer for damages caused by the strike. And peaceful picketing, providing they have held a secret ballot in advance and given the employer at least one week's notice. Number two, um, the Workplace Relations Commission or the WRC. Now this is an important one as well because it's relatively new. It was set up in 2015 by the government and it's mainly to promote the improvement of workplace relations. The maintenance of good workplace relations and to encourage compliance with relevant employment legislation. It assumes the roles and the functions previously carried out by the National Employment Rights Authority. It also takes over the role of the Equality Tribunal, the Labour Relations Commission and the Rights Commission Service. So what are the functions then of the work, Workplace Relations Commission? The first one is to provide an advisory service and this works closely with the employers, trade unions and employees in non-dispute situations in order to promote, develop and implement best industrial relations for all employees. It also looks at policies, practices and procedures. It also gives advice to the government on employment legislation. The WRC also provides a conciliation service to provide an impartial, timely and effective conciliation service. They encourage parties to listen to each other in order to help them reach an agreement. 
They also provide a mediation service. This helps to achieve a voluntary resolution of a complaint or grievance. They provide an inspector service. Um, an inspector service of the WRC are authorised to carry out inspections in order to monitor and enforce compliance with employment legislation. The identity of the compla complaint is not, is not divulged to the employer unless the, the person complaining has given his or her consent to do so. Okay, so another important aspect, if, if um, the WRC comes up in the exam paper, you could be asked to evaluate the work um, the WRC. So the, in order to do that, this would be a typical example. The WRC helps to improve industry relations, reducing the strikes and loss of service to customers. It also helps the employee by recovering unpaid wages and is impartial service that gives them a chance to challenge their employer and to try solve their issue without facing large solicitors fees by taking them to court. So that's um, the evaluation of the WRC which as I said is important to note. The third legislative method of solving conflict is the Labour Court. The Labour Court investigates disputes not resolved by the use of other options including the WRC. These include cases such as equal pay, harassment, sexual harassment, promotion, overtime, changes to work hours or work practices. Okay, so the arbitration then. The Labour Court is not a court of law and that's important to remember. It operates as an industrial relations tribunal, hearing both sides in a case and then issuing a recommendation. This recommendation sets out the court's options on the dispute and the terms on which it should be settled. The Code of Practice. If there are complaints about a breach of, of the Code of Practice, the Labour Court will investigate them under the Industrial Relations Act 1990. The court also gives its option to any interpretation of the Codes of Practice in place under this Act. Registers agreements then. The Labour Court registers employment agreements for employees and employers. These are useful for parties to refer to if future industrial conflict may arise. Again, we need to be able to evaluate the Labour Court. In most cases, the Labour Court's recommendations are accepted by the disputing parties such as the, IN, uh, the IMNO and the government in 2019. It is also a free and impartial service. Okay, now we're going to move on to the Unfair Services Act 1977 to 2015. This act protects employees from being unfairly sacked from their jobs by setting out criteria for what, by which dismissals are judged to be unfair and providing a system and redress for employee found to be unfairly sacked. This Act states that every sacking is unfair and therefore illegal unless the, employee, the employer can prove that this was fair. The law only applies to employees with one year's continuous service with the employer. Although this requirement Although this requirement that you must be in the job one year does not apply in the case of dismissal arising from pregnancy, maternity leave, adoptive leave, parental leave or care leave and trade union membership or activities. The law does not apply to employees aged under 16 or the, or the normal retiring age in the job and older. Okay, what are deemed as reasons for fair dismissal then? The first one is in, incapable of doing a job. If an employee is just simply not able to do their job, this would be seen as fair dismissal. If the person is deemed not qualified, so if the employer hires somebody 
with the idea that they had the qualifications to carry out the job and the employer later finds out they have not got the qualifications, then this will be deemed as a fair dismissal. Incompetence, if an employee fails to meet the standards of work expected of him, he or she can also be sacked and this will be deemed as fair dismissal. Misconduct, if an employee um, reports to work um, in a drunken state, if they're deemed, if they're found stealing or bullying other employees or employer, or if there's an assault issue, this will be deemed as a fair dismissal. Also, redundancies will be seen as a fair dismissal, provided that the redundancy was carried out accordingly, and also it was open and transparent. Reasons then for unfair dismissal, you cannot dismiss a lady if she's pregnant, Union activities, every employee has the right to join a union and if they do so, that cannot be seen as a, as a reason to dismiss somebody. You cannot dismiss somebody because of their re religious or political beliefs. A person cannot be dismissed because of their race, their age, if they're involved in an accident and they decide they're suing the employer for negligence, an employee in that case cannot be um, sacked. And you cannot um, dismiss somebody because they're from the travelling community or because of somebody's sexual orientation. Okay, the steps then that must be followed when dismissing an employee. So there's a number of steps that have to be followed here and it's very important that the employer does so. The first one is counselling. If there is an issue between the employer and the employee, the employer must discuss the issue with the employee and they must try to address it for him. All support, whether training, um, etc., must be provided to the employee. If that's not working, a formal verbal warning must be issued by the employer to the employee. Following then, if the issue isn't, isn't addressed, written warnings. So the employer should follow up verbal warning. It is a formal letter warning, outlining the reasons for the possible dismissal. A copy should also be sent to the employee's shop steward so they have information regarding. And a final written warning may be issued and it's at that point then that the employee must leave their job. Okay, employee's right to appeal this dismissal then. The employee has right to be represented at a hearing into her dismissal. This hearing must be fair and impartial. It must consider the evidence presented by the employer and the represent representations made by the employee or her representative and deliver a non-biased determination of the matter. Okay, what are the the redress is then for unfair dismissal. So if a person is deemed to be unfairly dismissed, they can be reinstated back into their position of employment, re-engagement, which means they may be brought back into the workplace, but they might be given a different position. Or they may also receive compensation, usually monetary payment. Okay, so I'll go through what each one that is. Reinstatement. The employee is reinstated in their job. They are given the same title, pay and conditions and are entitled to any pay or improved conditions that they would have received during the period since they were unfairly dismissed. They are also entitled to compensation for the financial loss suffered since their unfair dismissal. Re-engagement. If the employee has contributed their dismissal, but it was still deemed unfair, they might be reappointed in a similar job or position from the date of the successful appeal. They do not receive any pay for the time they have been unemployed. Compensation. An employee might receive up to a maximum of two years pay for financial losses from their unfair dismissal. Okay, now we're going to have a look at the Employment Equality Act 1998 to 2015. 
an employee is said to be discriminated against if they are treated in a less favourable way than another person is, has been or would be treated in a comparable situation on any of the nine grounds um, Okay, the nine grounds then of discrimination would be seen as gender, marital status, religion, age, race, disability, family status, being a member membership of the travelling community, sexual orientation. There are the nine grounds um, which discrimination cannot take place. If an employee feels they were discriminated against, for example, a woman who feels that a male colleague was chosen for promotion ahead of her due to his gender. She can attempt to resolve the situation through the following actions. First of all, she would start off, would talk to with the employer and talk through the situation. She may seek to help from a third party. She may use a conciliation service. The WRC or the Workplace Relations Commission will offer advice on it on its website. Um, a jurisdiction ser service hears both sides and gives both parties a written decision for them to follow. Reinstatement, re-engagement or compensation. Okay, so from this topic the key terms and key words we looked at and these are very important for you to revise. Negotiation, conciliation, arbitration, trade dispute, secret ballot, primary picketing, secondary picketing, an official strike, fair dismissal, unfair dismissal, employment discrimination, the different re redresses for unfair dismissal, or sorry, unfair discrimination, the Labour Court, the WRC, okay, so they're things, they're very, very important key terms and words. Okay, so previous questions, this comes up regularly in both higher and ordinary level. Higher level questions include 2011 question 1 part C, 2017 question 1 part B, 2014 question 1 part A. It often comes up as a short question in section A of both higher and ordinary level. In 2015, short question 9, 2011, short question 7, 2018, question 1, part C, 2012, question 1, part A, 2016, question 1, part A, and 2015, question 1, part C. It would be a good idea maybe to practice some of those questions. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for taking the time to listen to the presentation. And I just want to wish you the very best of luck revising this chapter. Good morning, my name is Miss Walsh and I'm going to talk you through insurance and taxation this morning. Um, if you just want to sit back and relax and enjoy the presentation. Okay, insurance and taxation, that's coming from Unit 4. Okay, so the learning intentions for today's lesson Illustrate the difference between various principles of insurance. Identify the various insurance forms. Define risk management and illustrate ways a business can effectively manage risk. Outline the types of insurance a business and a household might use. We're also going to look at outline the types of taxation a business and household might have to pay. Illustrate the implications of different taxes for a business and a household, calculate take home pay for an employee and explain the importance of tax and insurance for a business. We're also going to look at identifying common activity, sorry, identify activities common to managing a business and a household and finally we're going to understand the similarities and differences between these activities in a business context and in a household context. Okay, so let's begin by saying what is, just identifying what is insurance. Insurance is protecting against something which might happen in the future. For example, a car accident or your house burning down. Okay, there's five principles of insurance and these are so important for you to remember. Number one is the utmost good faith. Number two is insurable interest. 
number three is indemnity, number four is subrogation, and number five is contribution. Okay, so I'm going to talk you through each one individually, and the first one is utmost good faith. You, when taking out insurance, you must disclose all material facts about the item you wish, wish to insure when filling out your proposal form. For example, when applying for life assurance, an applicant is asked to disclose information on their family history. The insurance company will record the information and may verify it if the company has to pay out compensation. So for example, if you're filling out a life assurance form or a proposal form for life assurance and you're a smoker, it is essential that you disclose that fact because that would be very important going forward. The second principle of insurance is insurable interest. The insured person must gain from the existence of the insured item and suffer financially from its loss. In other words, if you insure your own car, but not your it's for example, you can insure your own car but not your neighbour's car as, as you would not directly suffer financially for the loss of the car if something was to happen to it. The third principle is indemnity and this means that a person cannot make a profit from an insurance policy. So for example, if a bike originally cost 3000 and was 5 years old when stolen, the insured person should only receive the current or replacement value of the bike but not the original purchase price of the 3000 because at the end of the day your bike is now five years old. The fourth principle of insurance is subrogation. If the insurance company has paid out compensation to the insured party for an accident it can try to recover all losses by suing the person responsible for the accident. Contribution is the fifth principle of insurance. You cannot take out a policy for the same risk and collect both in, from both insurers, as you would then profit from the insurance, which means that we would then be breaking the principle of indemnity, which we've just looked at. For example, if an office building was worth 10 million, it was insured for 5 million with two different insurance companies. If damage, if suffered damage of two million, the insur insurance company is providing half of the cover, so each party, each half pays the loss, which is a million euros. Okay, there's a number of different insurance insurance terms, which is very important that you would note and remember for your exam. The first one is average clause. So what does it mean, the, the term average clause, when it comes to insurance? Basically, average clause applies to an, an item, sorry, applies if an item is underinsured and there is a partial loss. This means the loss was less than the full value that the item was insured for. So for example, if a bike was insured for 2,000, but its real value was 5,000, this indicates that the, the bicycle was underinsured by 3,000 and the damage of the bicycle is 1,000 euros. Then the insured party should not receive 1,000 euros in compensation as they do not have the whole bike insured. So in this situation, they have two-fifths of the bike insured. So so should only receive two-fifths of the partial loss, which is two-fifths multiplied by a thousand, giving you 400 euros. So the formula, you need to know this formula. So how to calculate the average clause for an underinsured item. So how the formula for that is the amount insured divided by the value of the asset multiplied by the loss so in this case, the amount insured was 2,000, the actual value of the asset was 5,000, multiplied by the loss incurred on, by, for the bike, and when you work that out, you get 500, 400 euros. That is how much the person is entitled to in compensation, because the bicycle had been underinsured. Okay, 
The next insurance term I want to talk to you um, about is proposal form. A proposal form is used when a person wishes to apply for insurance cover. The person applying for insurance cover must disclose all material facts when filling out the form. This information is used by the insurance company to calculate the insurance premium based on all the potential risks. So in other words, the higher the risk, the higher the premium. So if the more issues that appear on your proposal form, that would in increase the risk. Okay, so what is an insurance policy then? This is the contract between the insured and the insurance company. And it basically outlines the terms and conditions of the insurance cover. Okay, another insurance term is important to note is a premium and a premium is a fee paid to the insurance company by the insured to cover a risk that they may face in the future. Another term is an actuary. So what is an actuary? That is a person who calculates an insurance premium. Another insurance term is a no claims bonus. The policy holder will get a discount or deduction under motor insurance premium for every year that they do not make a claim. So a no claims bonus is important to reduce the overall premium. And it's just worth noting there as well that on a renewal date, the insured company must send out the insured person a copy of their no claims bonus. Another insurance term is insurance claim form. This is a form which must be filled in when a person requ requests to be reimbursed or compensated following an incident for which they may have insurance cover. Okay, now we're going to just look at the different factors that affect the size of your insurance premium. Again, just to reflect, an insurance premium is the money that you pay in order to have an item insured. The first one is the level of risk involved. The second one is the value of the item. The third is the number of claims that you may have already made in the past. The fourth is the profit level required by the insurance company. And the fifth is the govern government levies imposed. Okay, so we're going to look at each one individually then. So the first, the level of risk involved. So the higher the risk, the higher the premium. A loading is added to a premium for a higher risk. A deduction makes a premium cheaper. So for example, statistically young male drivers are more likely to be involved in an accident, so therefore they may face a higher premium. The second factor is the value of the item. The higher the value of the actual item you wish to insure, the higher the proportion compensation, therefore, the higher the premium. So for example, a bike worth 4,000 would cost more to insure than a bike worth 1,000, as the potential loss for the insurance company is much greater. The third factor is the number of claims made. If the insurance company sees an increase in the number of claim of payouts, for a claim, it will increase the cost of premiums. For example, statistically, young male drivers are more likely to be involved in an accident, therefore, they are charged higher premiums. Back to the higher the risk, the higher the premium. Number four, another factor would be the profit level required by insurance company. Insurance companies such as Aviva and Irish Life Health, they are public limited companies. So their main objective is to achieve higher profits in order to satisfy their shareholders. And number five, you also take into consideration the government levies. This is a, le a levy is an extra charge imposed on insurance on an insurance type by the government. So for example, the government introduced a 2% levy on motor insurance premiums in 2018, and this is to last seven years. This has led to an increase in motor insurance premiums for all. Okay, now I'm going to look at risk management. So what does that mean? Risk management is a planned approach 
to handling the risk that a business is exposed to. It involves identifying all the possible risks it faces and taking measures to reduce those risks in order to minimize any future negative effects. Okay, examples of risks facing a business include the first one is the risk of a fire on their premises, a personal injury to somebody on the premises, whether it be employee, customer, etc., the company product harming a consumer, storm damage to the premises or stock, and the theft of stock by employees. Now how can a, a business minimise risks? The first thing they can do is take out an insurance policy to protect themselves against this. They can introduce safety procedures within their business. They can also provide training courses for all staff so that they can better identify risks and respond to them quickly before an incident occurs. Introduce a health and safety measure i.e. regulations, health and safety drills, the identification of potential ha hazards. They can also install safety systems, IC, IC um, security cameras, security gates, etc. Insurance to protect against business risks. Okay, there's a various number of insurance which a company can take out to protect themselves against risks. The first one is buildings insurance. This protects the business against loss or damage to the structure of the building if it's caused by fire, flood or storm. You can also take out an insurance called contents insurance. And this protects against the loss or damage to contents caused by burglary, flood or fire. And buildings insurance and contents insurance go hand in hand. So it's usually buildings and contents insurance. Plate glass insurance. This is an insurance which protects against breakage or damage to large panes of glass such as shop front windows. Another insurance which is commonly taken out by, insur by businesses would be motor insurance. Third party insurance is the minimum cover that a person requires by law to have a vehicle on the road. It protects everyone injured in the accident except the policyholder. Another type of motor insurance is third-party fire and theft insurance. This cover protect, it provides third-party cover as above, plus losses to the policyholder for damage to their vehicle from fire and theft. And the third type of motor insurance is comprehensive insurance. And this insurance policy protects everyone involved or injured, or injured in an accident, including the policyholder. So motor insurance is usually um, a must for businesses because most of them would have vehicles on the road. Another type of insurance a business may have is product liability insurance and this protects the business in the event of a defective product that might cause harm to a customer. Another insurance is product liability insurance. This protects, protects a business against claims by members of the public or injury or loss resulting either from an accident on the business premises or the actions of the business. Employer liability insurance. This covers a business against claims made by employees as a result of accidents in the workplace. Key person insurance protects the business against the loss of a valued or a valuable staff member. Fidelity insurance protects a business against dishonesty or fraud committed by an employee. And another in important insurance to have for business is goods and transit insurance. This protects a business against loss suffered from theft or loss of goods while in transit. Damage caused during transit or the consequence of any delay in trans transiting the goods. Okay, so that's the type of insurance relevant for a business. Now we'll just look at household risks and insurance types. So health insurance. Many households take out insurance policy. This provides protection against the cost of medical care, attending hospitals, etc. Life insurance. A sum of money 
either upon the death of the policy holder or at the end of a specific time period from which the policy was taken out. If somebody has a mortgage, it's a legal requirement for them to have life assurance. And you can see it's buildings insurance, it's life assurance. Life assurance means that you're assuring something which will happen. Another type of household insurance is motor insurance. Again, if the family have a car, they will need to insure that in order for it to be allowed to drive on the road. It's a legal requirement. House and contents insurance. Again, this covers the replacement of the structure, or physical structure of the building and of all fixtures in your home. Mortgage protection insurance pays off the remainder of the mortgage if you pass away before the loan is repaid. And gadget insurance, this protects your mobile phone, your tablets, your laptops, etc. if lost, stolen or damaged. Okay, so what are the similarities then between household and business insurance? Both carry a risk assessment. Both must apply for and fill out a proposal form. Both must reassess and update the value of their items on an annual basis to avoid underinsuring or overinsuring over the items. The difference between business and household insurance. The first one is business face a larger amount of risk because there's more people involved, customers, employees, etc. And business face higher potential financial losses than a household because of the size of it etc. Businesses can treat insurance premiums as a taxable expense whereas households cannot. So that means that a business who pay various different insurance policies can claim that as an expense when, pay, when doing their tax returns. Okay now we're going to just move on to taxation and we're going to look at the different taxes that are paid by households and business. First of all I'm going to talk you through the taxation paid by business. The first one is your VAT, value added tax. This is an indirect tax charged on goods of, on the sale of goods and services. The standard rate of VAT is 23% on goods, 13.5% on services and zero VAT on medical, medical supplies and stable goods. A business can register for VAT and claim refunds on any VAT spent. Another type of tax paid by business is called corporation tax. This tax is charged on company profits. Current rate of corporation tax is 12.5%. So if a business operates a private limited company, they pay corporation tax. Self-assessment. Self-employed people must fill their own tax returns at the end of the financial year by completing a Form 11 or a Form 12 and submitting it to the revenue commissioners. This tax is due on or before the 31st of the 10th every year and what is owed is based on the tax on the income which they earned the previous year. And a business also pays customs duties and this is a tax paid on any imported goods. It applies on top of VAT for goods imported from outside a trading block. So in other words, goods that a business imports from outside the EU, they will have to pay a customs duty on them. It would be an additional tax charged on US goods imported into Ireland. Employees PRSI then is the main source of funding the government receives for social welfare. Both employers and employees must pay PRSI and PRSI stands for Pay Related Social Insurance. A business must also pay commercial rates. These are charges business owners pay to local authorities to fund the upkeep of local community footpaths, parks, roads, etc. So if you have a shop in a town, you have to pay commercial rates and that money will look after the footpaths, the roads, the parks and everything within that town. Okay, so the household taxes then. So self-assessment income tax, okay. So if you're a, an employee, your tax will automatically be deducted from your salary by your employer and the employer will send, subsequently pay that to the revenue commissioners on your behalf. Um, 
Okay, you also can submit a self-assessed income tax form to see if there any tax you can claim back. You also pay PRSI, which again is pay, pay related social insurance. You pay VAT, a value added tax on products and services that you purchase. You also pay local property tax. This is a tax paid by house owners need to value their and um, so basically how, how that works is householders householders need to value their residential property and then pay a charge on it based on the market value of your property it, peep, um, householders may also pay deposit interest retention tax or dirt this is a tax paid on the interest earned on savings accounts a householder may also have to pay capital gains tax or CGT. This is a tax charge on profits you make when you sell an asset that you own. Capital acquisition tax is another tax. This is a tax applied oh, this is a tax applies to gifts and inheritance that you might receive. Universal social charge USC. This is a tax on your gross earnings. Finally, motor tax. Again, if you have a, a car, it's a legal requirement to have motor tax on the car in order to use the public roads. Okay, and just going back, then just previous previous exam questions which have come up in this area, I would advise you to have a look at and attempt for revision purposes. 2016, it came up in the short questions, question four. 2018, question five, part B. 2018 question 6 part C, 2018 question 5 part A, 2015 question 6 part A, again it came up as a short question, 2019 question 7, again as a short question, 2016 and that was question 4. Okay, key terms then and key words, utmost good faith, insurable interest, indemnity, subrogation and contribution, they are again the five principles of insurance. Key, other key words then we need to know in relation to insurance is average clause. Okay, I would like to thank you for taking the time to listen to my presentation. I just want to wish you the very best of luck in revising. Thank you. Good morning, this is Ms. Walsh here. Um, I'm going to talk you through today um, a, a class on enterprise. and um, This chapter can be used for both business and LCVP purposes. Okay, so Enterprise Chapter 4 in Business. Um, the learning intentions for today's lesson. Define entrepreneurship. Why become an entrepreneur? Characteristics of an entrepreneur. Enterprise within a business. Enterprise within the community. We're also going to look, in, look at ways of supporting for entrepreneurs. Tool for planning SWOT analysis. I'm going to talk you through a case study of Ryanair and apply your SWOT analysis to that and I'm also going to look at types of planning. Okay let's commence by looking at what an entrepreneur is. An entrepreneur is a person who spots a gap in the marketplace and uses innovation to create a new good or service in order to make a profit while taking on a personal financial risk of failure. A typical example of an entrepreneur is Suzanne Jackson with her Susumi range. And Noelle O'Connor, she is an entrepreneur and she came up with the idea of um, Tan Organic. Okay, why does one become an entrepreneur? The first thing is to earn an income. Secondly, to become your own boss. And to, if they have a limited career path. If they spot a gap in the market then they feel they can fulfil it. Um, because there's lots of government support out there from LEO, which is the local enterprise office, they, if they were made redundant and they have redundancy money, they might decide to, to reinvest that redundancy money. Or they may be inspired by other entrepreneurs. Okay, so now we're going to look at the characteristics and skills of entrepreneurs. Again, this is a very common area in, in the Leaving Cert, both junior, uh, both higher and ordinary level and also as an LCVP question. Okay, the first characteristic of an entrepreneur is innovative. 
And a person has to have the ability to be creative, to come up with new ideas or in new processes for improving something that already exists to compete with it. A second characteristic, human relations, have the ability to communicate effectively with other stakeholders and get on well with people. They have the ability to network effectively, to build relationships with others and be persuasive in negotiation. Another characteristic of an entrepreneur is flexibility. They must have the ability to respond to a changing environment and adapt when faced with change. They are also creative and are not scared to adapt in order to succeed rather than stick with their original plan. You know, an entrepreneur needs a bit of flexibility. Another characteristic, reality perception. They must have the ability to see things as they are, not how they would like them to be. Another characteristic, they must be proactive. Do not wait for things to happen. They use their initiative to act before they have to react to a changing environment. So they have good foresight in things. Um, future focus, have the ability to anticipate gap, future trends and you use research, both primary and secondary, to spot potential gaps in the market. They try to take advantage of these gaps. Another characteristic of an entrepreneur is decisive. They have the ability to act quickly under pressure and are able to weigh up the pros and cons of an event and make a decision. They, are, they also have the ability to be confident of their decision and not second guess themselves. They're determined. In other words, they're resilient in tough times. So if the business is not going to plan, they need to have the self-belief necessary to preserve and take corrective action in order to improve the situation they find themselves in. An entrepreneur is also a risk taker, as we've seen in the definition. This means that they have the ability to take on the personal financial risk of investing in a business when there is no guarantee of profits. They can face the reality of a business failing and going bankrupt. They are prepared to accept the risk in order to be successful and therefore make a profit. Okay, so I'm going to talk you through enterprise within a business. Okay, so a person um, who is enterprising within the business is known as an entrepreneur or entrepreneurship. So let's look at entrepreneurship. It occurs when an employee comes up with a new innovative idea within a business, taking a personal responsibility for their suggestion but no financial risk, so that their new idea turn into a profitable event for the business. Okay, so they come up with an idea for a new product or service. So an example there would be Facebook holds hackathons for their staff. These are competitions for coders and engineers to develop ideas into prototypes. This, lead to face, this led to Facebook creating the like button for its website. Just to recap, a prototype is a mock or a, a, new, a, a model of a product that may be put into production. So it's a sample of a product. They come up with ways to streamline production or reduce the cost of production. For example, a factory worker in Largo Foods who produces potato crisps finds a way to produce the same number of packets 10% quicker by changing the steps they use. This person will be seen as, uh, as an entrepreneur within Largo, Largo Foods. Entrepreneurs also come up with new ways of increasing revenue. For example, Body First Nutrition Worker came up with a like and share competition on social media as a way to promote the company's range of products. They also come up with new procedures or work methods like a new production process. For example, a Cadbury's worker comes up with an idea of resealable packaging so that the chocolate bars last longer, remain fresher. 
Okay, so let's just have a look at methods of promoting in, 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 in methods of promoting entrepreneurship within a business. So employers may create a culture for enterprise. They may give employees extra resources for enterprise. They may incentivize, incentivize workers to create ideas, use teamwork, and pay for training courses. Okay, let's look at enterprise within our community then. It creates jobs and business for local people. The wages or profits they receive give them a higher standard of living that they would have if they stay, if, than they would have if they stayed on social welfare. For example, some unemployed people from Ballymun in Dublin who set up their community enterprise Green Caps to provide a partage service in nearby Dublin Airport, all benefited in this way. Some people spent money they made from their job or business in their local shops, pubs, restaurants, banks, hotels, etc. This creates a spin-off effect in the community. People in the community see others setting up businesses and this gives them the innovation and courage to set up their own business. This leads to more enterprising within the community. The government also benefits because they receive taxes from the new business and therefore will have to pay out less social welfare payments, leaving, leaving the government with more money to spend on local hospitals, schools, roads, etc. Infrastructure in the local area will also improve um, as a result of entrepreneurship within the community. Okay, so then the very supports that are available for entrepreneurship within the community or the country or within business, local enterprise office known as LEO, leader program and area partnership companies. Okay, so I'm going to talk you through each one and how they benefit and support companies. The first one, local enterprise office or LEO, provides the following support services for entrepreneurs. The first one is a mentoring program. Leo connects with companies with experienced experts that have been successful in business. They offer one-to-one -one advice and guidance to the business. They also offer regular group advice clinics. They provide training programs and advice. They organize workshops about different situations that a new or growing business might encounter. They have lots of helpful articles and YouTube videos available for entrepreneurs who can browse and learn from them. Business networking, they organize networking events which put entrepreneurs and connect in contact with new like-minded people whose experience and knowledge can greatly help solve day-to-day -day issues. They also provide financial support Leo provides a range, a, a range of grant assistance to eligible companies to help fund startup costs, expansion plans, entry into new markets and job growth. Okay, you may be asked to evaluate Leo. So Leo, the local enterprise office, office provides valuable funding and advice, but they also have detailed knowledge of local authority regulations planning, accessibility, environment, procurement and other issues affecting business in a certain area, which can be helpful. Their aid and services are especially useful to new businesses. The second type of support for entrepreneurs is Leader Programme. And this is an EU funded initiative designed to assist rural communities in creating enterprise that suits their own local communities or areas. The programme supports projects that improve rural tourism, enterprise development, broadband and basic services. They are targeted at hard to reach communities and rural youth. Rural, uh, rural youth. For example, Dublin Rural Leader had a budget of 4.83 million to fund new initiatives in 2019. Its aim is to help achieve economic development or social inclusion are to improve the rural commu community environment. The third support is area partnership companies. 
These assist and encourage local enterprise and try to improve the standard of living for local communities. They offer training courses, volunteering roles to develop experience, the short-term employment on local projects, they can focus on particular groups and communities that might be regarded as social excluded, including children and families in disadvantaged areas, people with disabilities, the unemployed, the traveller community. For example, Waterford Area Partnership works with disadvantaged communities and identifies target groups with the objective of overcoming barriers to them sharing equality in the economic, cultural and social life of Waterford. Okay, I'm going to just talk you through planning then. It's very important for entrepreneurs to plan. So when I talk about planning, I'm, I refer to planning involves a business setting goals and objectives and then outlining strategies that allows it to achieve this or them. Many entrepreneurs carry out what's called a SWOT analysis. A SWOT analysis is used in the pre-planning phase. It is used to analyze a situation when you are trying to devise a strategy for a plan. The SWOT analysis, the S stands for strengths, which are internal factors. The W, weakness, which are also internal factors. The O is opportunities which are external factors, and T, threats, which are external factors. But the strengths and weaknesses are internal factors, and that means that the business has actually ha has a, a say in what happens. So in other words, they can try and work on their, their, their internal factors, their strengths and their weaknesses. Opportunities and threats are external factors, and it's more difficult for the business to focus or uh, uh, tackle them. Okay, so I'll talk you through the various different strengths. Possible strengths of a business are your USP, your unique selling point, their brand name, the product design, the features of their product, the actual price of their product, their large market share, they could have a highly skilled, highly educated workforce, and good social media presence. They would be strengths for any business. Their weaknesses then could possibly be a high input cost, so the cost of raw materials might be quite expensive. There's there, um, the lack of skilled workers in certain areas. So for example, they might have very few employees who are skilled in finance, for example. Limited product range. So they might need to expand their product range in order to uh, reach a wider target audience. They might have a poor brand recognition. So that's something they would need to work on. Poor product feature or function, no website or e-commerce, poor customer service and a lack of investment in research and development. All the weaknesses within a business are something the business can address and work towards improving. The opportunities then, again as I said, are external factors and are more difficult to um, overcome. So for example, changes in legislation, larger trading blocks or the removal of trade barriers which cause difficulty for importing and exporting of goods, changing customer demands or tra trends, and also changing exchange rates. Again, these are beyond the control, really, of the entrepreneur. Threats, then, again, are external factors, and again, are difficult for the business to overcome. Examples would include new competitors entering the market, um, shortages in raw materials, changes in exchange rates, changes in tax laws, and more recently, more barriers to trade, for example, how, what, how things are going to be affected after Brexit. Okay, I'm going to talk you through an example of a SWOT analysis, and I'm using a Ryanair as an example. Okay, the strengths of Ryanair then, they're a very well recognized brand name, they have a high service performance, flights tend to arrive on time, and that's something they really act on. Website, and they use their websites for booking, which lowers the cost of bookings. Their CEO, their chief executive officer, Mr. Michael O'Leary, has tight control over his business. They have a small headquarters or a head office, which means that they have lower overhead costs. Weaknesses then within Ryanair, it's prone to bad press for their customer service. 
The CEO is often seen as being outspoken and makes controversial statements. Industry relations issues, there's ongoing problems regarding strikes by pilots, cabin crew, etc. Opportunities then for Ryanair, increasing demand for short haul flights, consolidation in the short haul airline sector with some competitors closing and this provides an opportunity to gain market share. Long haul flights, there is a scope to expand, expand into transnational routes for Ryanair. Threats for Ryanair then, fluctuating oil prices increases the cost of um, fuel. Low fare competition, there are still many airlines competing for Ryanair's market share. Brexit also proves another threat. Natural disaster, there's a natural disaster of in 2010, the, um, the Islamic, Icelandic volcano, and um, this caused a huge disruption to air travel. Students, okay, so students may be asked in your exam to prepare SWOT analysis on a given case study or give an example of one prepared earlier, such as Ryanair. Okay, so that's, that's something you need to, to, to note. So that's a, typical, a, a good example of a SWOT analysis done for you. Okay, types of plans then. There's um, various different types of plans that um, an entrepreneur would need to look at. There's a mission statement, there's strategic planning, there's tactical planning, operation planning and contingency planning and I'm just going to talk you through each one. So a mission statement is sets out reasons why the business exists and describes the motivation behind the company or the entrepreneur. A strategic planning outlines the long-term goals of the business um, and are go the, sorry outlines how the long-term goals of the business are going to be reached and use, using ideas taken from the mission statement. Tactical planning is a short-term planning that breaks the strategic plan into shorter, more manageable periods. Tactical planning deals with the now part of the plan and is usually drawn up by middle management. It is important as it makes longer-term plans more relevant for the short-term operations by breaking them into smaller, achievable chunks. Operation planning then is planning is the planning of the day-to-day -day activities of the business, including timetabling of staff for the week or month, or deciding on production qualities for the week, quantities for the week. A contingency planning then, this is a backup plan to cope with emergencies, unforeseen events, or unexpected circumstances. All companies need a plan B. Okay, so the key words then, um, we need to know the char what is an entrepreneur, what is on entrepreneurship, the characteristics and skills of entrepreneurs, SWOT analysis, be able to carry out a SWOT analysis on a company of your choice. I've given you a, a very good example there of Ryanair. You need to be able to look at the different types of plans, a strategic plan, a mission statement, tactical plan, operation plans and contingency plans. So they're key areas for entrepreneurship. Now, I just want to wish you the very best of luck um, with, the, with the revision of this chapter. Thank you.